Uh, thank you very much for coming out here. Um, and I should thank a few other people. Um, Baker Publishing for publishing a book that I'm going to be drawing, uh, that I wrote and I'm going to be drawing a lot on. Uh, Calvin University has supported this work, my home institution. The American Scientific Affiliation up there, if you haven't heard of them, it's an organization of Christians in science that really helped me over the last four decades uh, do a lot of thinking about this. And biologos.org. Um, if you're interested in questions of, of science and Christian faith, origins and other topics, and you're looking for something with rigorous science and Christ-centered faith and gracious dialogue, that they have the best collection of resources that I can recommend. So um, very much welcome and thank you for being here. And as I was thinking about this talk and who would be here, and even as I was writing my book, I, I'm hoping I can speak to uh, several different audiences at once. If you're here because you're convinced that about the scientific evidence for human evolution, um, but you're curious or uncertain or skeptical about the claims of Christianity, welcome. I'm very glad you're here. You, I want to reassure you, you don't have to give up your science. You don't have to turn off your brain when you're talking about hard issues like this with Christians. So um, I, I look forward to hearing uh, your questions and having a discussion. Uh, if you are, on the other hand, perhaps someone who is convinced about the broad claims of Christianity are true, maybe you're fine with human evolution, or maybe you're curious or uncertain or even skeptical about the science of human evolution. Uh, if you have questions in that area, I want to assure you from, from my own perspective, um, you don't have to worry that you have to give up your faith if you find the science of human evolution convincing. So. Uh, how can I say this? Well, it's, it's based on experience in my own life. Um, as a scientist, and also re interacting and talking with a lot of theologians, uh, as a scientist, I can tell you that uh, the scientific community, we are often uh, in situations where two well-established theories seem to make conflicting predictions. Ask any physicist here about general relativity and quantum mechanics. They'll tell you about that. Um, now, in those situations, we don't just throw one out. Uh, if we're really convinced that there's some serious truth that's, that's being got at in this theory, um, we think that if we got to keep working at it to try and get a deep underlying unity. And um, theologians and biblical scholars have a similar experience with scripture. Scripture written over many decades, many cultures, different languages, and you don't have to look too hard to sometimes find two scripture passages that seem at first to teach contradictory things. But those who really dwell in these scriptures don't just throw one out and say, well, I guess we'll believe one and not the other. Um, they keep working at it. They dig into the meaning and the culture and the language and what's behind these scripture and the context. And they report again and again that they find an overarching coherent voice in the message that emerges. And so I see both science and theology working together. I know there are times, and there have been historical times, where it looked like, hey, it, the claims of Christian theology and the latest science coming out seem at first to conflict. Now, I believe uh, that uh, God inspired scripture. I believe that God um, created this world, and I don't think God would teach contradictory things. So from my own perspective, I expect coherence, but I don't always expect it to come easy. I may have to do some work learning more science, learning some philosophy of science. I may have to do some work learning more theology and biblical interpretation and go to experts in those fields. And, and that's what I've tried to do in this field. So actually, let me go back in time and tell you about my very first experience with this as a kid. I was probably 10 or 11 or 12. I remember the pastor tell, t asking us a question. Um, hey, um, you, you hear that um, you know, science says that uh, gravity keeps planets in orbits around the sun, but uh, doesn't the Bible say God is in charge of that sort of thing? Is that a contradiction? And that was a very good question to ask a bunch of kids and let us think about it for a while. And, and you know, we, we, we kind of figured out what was going on there. I learned something about science that day, something very valuable. A scientific explanation doesn't replace God. You don't have to choose one or the other. Both can be true. And that's helped me sort of bold, go boldly into learning science. And I was encouraged um, by my pastor and my family and my church to study science. Now, I didn't quite realize it very well back then, but eventually I realized I learned something about scripture that day, too. Because, uh, you know, those passages in the Psalms and the Old Testament passages, they don't mention gravity anywhere. 
And you wouldn't expect that of them, right? Back then, the ancient Hebrews and the surrounding cultures pictured a flat earth with a solid dome sky, waters above and below, and the sun, moon, and stars moving across that solid dome firmament. And, and God wanted to speak into that culture. God wanted to, uh, to tell them something they needed to hear, I believe. And one of the important messages they probably needed to hear was that you know the sun, moon, and star, and skies, and oceans were not the gods worshipped in the Egyptian pantheon or the Assyrian pantheon. And God had to meet uh, his listeners where they were at. So God did not say, well, I'm going to teach you some important theological truths, but first you have to learn that the earth is spherical and it moves around the sun, and then i got to tell you about the Big Bang and galaxy formation and, and DNA. No. Um, no, God met them where they're at. Something that those of us who are teachers or hope to be teachers understand. If you have students with various levels of preparation, you try to meet them where they're at. Um, I got to quote John Calvin at least once because, you know, I teach at Calvin University. Um, theologians have a term for this, uh, at least some theologians. Like, I personally like this one very much. John Calvin saying, in regards to a different passage, uh, the Holy Spirit had no intention to teach astronomy, for example, in proposing uh, instruction meant to be common to the simplest and most uneducated person. Uh, he made use by, by Moses and the prophets of popular language so that no one can say, oh, this is too hard, I have to learn F equals M, I have to learn differential calculus before I can understand scripture. No. So God is gracious. God meets us where, where we are at. Um, and that, for me, that's been very valuable uh, in, in working through these issues. So, you know, as science developed over the centuries, you know, the ancient Greeks figured out the Earth was spherical and measured its, its radius pretty accurately. And, and then we got evidence that the Earth moved around the sun and then that there were elliptical orbits in Kepler's laws and then Newton's laws and then special relativity. And as science kept improving our understanding, the message that God was embedding in those early chapters could remain the same because God spoke in a way the original audience and authors could understand. So I found that a very helpful approach when dealing with this issue. Well, before I got to, to this issue, uh, human evolution, um, I first had to sort of think about an old earth and a big bang and evolution of plants and animals. But with that background I just described, it probably won't surprise you, it didn't take me long to figure out that, you know, there was a lot of good science behind Big Bang uh, and Old Earth and evolution of plants and animals. Good in the sense of many interlocking, overlapping lines of evidence that all reinforce. And also good in the sense that the scientists who were saying this were really motivated for good reasons to try and dig at the truth and understand better and better uh, our natural history. So also I, I wanted to go to then the theologians because, you know, there's a, a variety of interpretations of the early chapters of Genesis out there, some of which conflict with an old earth and evolution, but, but many of which do not. And so going to Old Testament scholars, I learned about the ancient cultures and, and history and language and the cultural and historical context of those. And that really helped me see that, that these interpretations of scripture, which did not conflict with an old earth and, and Big Bang and evolution of plants were really, really good interpretations that really got at what God was teaching to the original audience and original authors. Good, well-motivated, upholding the, the inspiration and, and authority of scripture and helping us understand what God was teaching. So, I, as I was going through all that, um, I thought, well, this isn't so bad, but I kind of knew in my head, and this was back when I was a physics graduate student, I was spending most of my time in the lab and trying to solve differential equations, but I kept thinking about this one. I, I kind of knew from my background growing up that if there was one topic where maybe science and Christian theology, were gonna, it's going to be harder to see the, the, the way they might go together, it would be on this issue. Um, human evolution and, and theo Christian theological topics like the soul and the image of God and especially original sin. And, and here's why. Theologians have written about these really important topics for centuries and for most of church history, most theologians understandably assumed that all humans descended from a single pair, Adam and Eve, created miraculously a few thousand years ago. And they wrote their theological reflections on these important topics with that background assumption. So 
it's looking like we're going to have to think through how to recast and refigure out what are the important truths in light of what we're now learning about human evolution. So, um, okay. So maybe if, uh, if you're here because you're less familiar with Christianity, but you're curious how Christians deal with this issue, you might be saying, okay, so, so what do you even mean by this original sin idea? Well, um, it's probably worth first talking, saying a little bit what we mean by sin and why, why even bring that up in the context of evolution. I mean, you could say evolution, okay, we know from studying evolution, we have reasons scientifically to understand why humans are sometimes nice to each other and sometimes nasty to each other from understanding, you know, what we understand of human evolution. So why bring up the topic of sin? Well, um, Scripture actually says a lot about sin, and this is going to be some of these first points are going to be familiar to all of you, whether you you grew up learning a lot of Christian theology or not. Um, when I talk about sin, and and other people who who talk about the subject talk about sin, um, it means things like this, and and this will be familiar. You know, it's nasty things that I do to others, but it's also the things that I think prior to doing the nasty things. Or, or it's the good things that I know I ought to do and I fail to do, but it's also the way I think prior to doing the wrong things. It's what we do and what we think. It's individual, but it's also corporate. We know that evil is systemic in so many ways. Um, it's actions we control, but sometimes it feels like an addiction that has power over us. It's a condition that we suffer on. And, we all have experiences like that. Uh, now, going a little further into how Christians in particular talk about sin, we say, well, we know it because of what we might call general revelation that everybody has, whether you read scriptures or not. We know from our reason that being nice to each other is better. We know from our conscience. Um, we know from our empathy often how we ought to behave, and everybody shares in experiences like that. But also, um, if you read scripture, we can also learn about things that we ought to do, uh, you know, things like it's not just good enough to love our friends and hate our enemies. Scripture says we have to love our enemies too, and when we fail to do that, that also is a sin. Um, and here's another way I find very helpful, a disordering of the law of love. Um, right, so in popular media, uh, often good and evil are portrayed as equal, as opposite forces. Not, not necessarily equal, because good usually triumphs, good cooperates, and evil doesn't, and good wins in the end. But nevertheless, opposites, uh, uh, two opposing forces, and that makes good drama. And it, it makes good grist for the psychological mill for people who are m mulling over how their choices in life might affect other people. But it's actually not good theology uh, to think about evil that way. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we love, that we would like to have, that isn't bad in and of itself. We want stability. We want money to enjoy good things. We want to have, you know, influence in the world. That's not bad in and of themselves. But in, in Christian theology, it says, okay, the best, the most important loves are, first of all, have a loving relationship with God, and then have a loving relationship with everything else. And everything, and everything, all the, all the other good things have to come after that. But we all sometimes take these other things that we want really badly and, and pursue them in ways that is disruptive to a loving relationship to God and a loving relationship to others. And in Christian theology, that's very often what we mean at, at the heart of what is sin. All right, so how do we human beings get into this situation? Well, we're going to talk about evolution in a minute. Um, but let's spend a little more time talking about the theology of original sin, the idea of original sin. I mean, is it even a big deal? You know, we can acknowledge we're all in this situation of doing nice and nasty things and having these opposing sides to ourselves. So, so why talk about original sin? Well, in Scripture, sin... It's a big deal. Whether you think original sin is a big deal or not, sin is a big deal because sin is what separate us, would separate us eternally from God without God's rescue. And it, we re, I read and I believe the centerpiece of that rescue is the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So, 
Yes, how much would God do to rescue us from sin? Well, part of God, Jesus, Son of God, fully divine, becoming human, living as human, suffering the worst, betrayal, death by torture, rejection, suffering the worst, and then forgiving it and asking us to participate in it. And then through the resurrection, uh, saying this then is now the way to follow to a new kind of life. That's what God would go through to rescue us. So yeah, you know, it's a big deal. Um, and that's why I thought it was worth my time. And, and a lot of other scholars who've written about this think it's worth their time to talk about this. Because the idea of original sin isn't just about what was the very first sin that humans committed. It, Often that's where a lot of the discussion comes in. It's really an attempt to summarize lots of things that are taught in many places in scripture. And um, I'll say a little bit about that uh, in a minute. Um, so yeah, there is a sort of a core doctrine of original sin. I'll try to summarize that. But there have always been disagreements around it. Theologians have had different perspectives. It's an important topic and there hasn't always been complete unanimity. And this has really benefited me. I said when I wanted to dive into this topic a few decades ago, one of the places I went to is church tradition. What have theologians written about this topic over the centuries? That was a marvelous treasure trove of, of uh, information. So if you ever have a topic that you want to think, how does Christian theology comp can, uh, work with this particular issue I'm wrestling with, go to church tradition. You may not find an easy answer, but you'll find a huge uh, trove of resources. So uh, things like this, I would kind of put in what I would call the core of, of original uh, doctrine of original sin, God is good. Sin that we talked about, a disordering of the loves, that is actually a rebellion against God's revealed will for what God wants for human flourishing. And now getting into that original stuff, um, some of the earliest sins by our ancestors, once you could actually call it sin, had consequences for them and had consequences for the descendants. And we're all in the situation today where we know none of us are gonna be able to live a life free from sin. And this is part of the sort of the core idea, the core central theology in, in Christian theology, that the incarnation, life, death, death, and resurrection of Jesus are just central to God's rescue plan for that problem. All right, so that's why I thought it was important to spend time thinking about how to put together what science is teaching us, um, uh, 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 and we're learning about human origins with the doctrine of original sin, even though Christians who've written about it for centuries in the past had sort of a different picture of human origins in mind. And after reading a whole bunch of books, I came to this conclusion. It's not the case that there's no way to put together the science of human evolution and the doctrine of original sin. I found I kind of had the opposite problem. I decided in the end there were way too many ways, and I hope to kind of sketch out a lay of the land for you um, tonight uh, to put them together. And I hope I communicate to you why I think this is actually a good problem to have. Um, all right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try and go really fast through big chunks of my book, like maybe like one PowerPoint slide for, per chapter. Uh, it really hurts an author to say something like that. But think of, it, think of it this way. I'm not gonna do these topics justice. I'm gonna put them on the table for you. So I'm gonna say a few words about what I think is an important topic in this whole area. And if that raises a question in your mind, think about it and ask about it later because I probably thought it was a good question too. Um, so one of the questions sometimes asked is, well look, if, if humans evolved, was God actually doing anything significant? Um, and I would say as a Christian, well, I've had, I haven't had a problem with that going all the way back to that a scientific explanation doesn't replace God. If I can affirm that we can understand scientifically uh, formation of stars and rain and birds feeding and embryonic development, but I can also see God's hand in that, then I can certainly see God's hand in evolution and even human evolution too. Now there is something else that happens at some point in, hu in the human story, which as far as we know doesn't happen in all these other stories. At some point God begins what we call special revelation to human beings, s establishing new kinds of relationships with human beings new kinds of relationships that uh, call for new kinds of responses, new levels of responses, and acceptance of rejection, and, and so forth. 
Now, I'm also asked something sometimes like this. Um, okay, so sure, God could have used evolutionary processes and God could use special revelation. Um, it's often Christians who ask this, and I, I respect why they ask that. Could we also like, maybe say there's some miracles, particularly when it comes to the origin of our species and our special relationship with God? And now speaking as a scientist, I would say, well, you know, there's certain kinds of miracles you might propose. I could say, no, that if that happened, we, we ought to see scientific evidence and we don't. And then there's other kinds of miracles that can be proposed, like, you know, God miraculously speaking to and giving a particular miraculous revelation to some Neolithic tribe somewhere that wouldn't leave scientific evidence. I couldn't say as a scientist it happened or not. Um, from theologians, I, I learned two important things to, to look out for here. Um, we want to avoid um, what's called God of the gaps theology, where we say, okay, if we have science, then we don't need God. So we just put God in these places that science can't, uh, can't explain. That's called God of the gaps theology. If, if we avoid that, um, and then another one is, uh, you may have heard of this or not, the idea that, well, maybe God did a miracle, but made it look like not. Maybe God miraculously created Homo sapiens, but made it look by all the all the uh, paleontology and genetics like we had common ancestry. Yeah, we, that's, I mean, I can't scientifically disprove that, but theologically, um, theologians warn us away from that. So, um, yeah, is God doing something special? Well, God is doing something special in everything we can scientifically study and understand. There's special revelation in human story. And then if one wants to say, I think a few miracles happened too of a certain coin, if you can avoid those two, I won't say you can't add those in. I would say maybe think about whether they're needed, but um, that's a possibility. So that's a whole chapter of my book. Let's move on. Uh, was there animal suffering and death in God's good creation? Well, yes, one implication of all this is that animals were around for literally hundreds of millions of years before humans, living and dying and living good lives and sometimes suffering. And, and when we study the natural world, it, we see what I might call package deals. There are dangerous parts of good systems. So plate tectonics is amazing and wonderful. Uh, you know, the motion of tectonic plates creates uh, mountains and ocean trenches and shorelines and all sorts of amazing places for rich ecosystems and a wide variety of ecosystems to develop. And if it wasn't for plate tectonics, uh, wind and and uh, water erosion would wash all the nutrients down to the soil, and life couldn't actually live on land for too long without plate tectonics bringing new materials up. And plate tectonics causes earthquakes sometimes. And so that seems to be part of the package deal. Mutations are a marvelous part of God's evolutionary design for diversity to increase in species and for them to uh, expand into new niches and develop greater complexity over time and sometimes mutations are harmful. It seems to be part of a package deal. Um, and theologically, um, Scripture gives us a way to think about that. Um, scripture doesn't say everything is either truly wonderful or a result of human, humans being bad. Theology actually gives us, Scripture actually gives us other categories. Early on, it talks, God talks and, and warns humans that there's a lot of wildness in creation, and subduing creation, I guess in the Hebrew words, we have an expert here who will tell us, doesn't mean paving it all over. Uh, it means being caretakers. Um, and so there is, there was, I believe, and Scripture does imply there was wildness to be taken care of and uh, part of it. And we can say more about that. And, and, you know, Jesus healed some sick, and even in one situation, a person was pointed to and saying, why is this person sick? Was it because of their sin and, or their parents' sin? And Jesus said, neither. But Jesus did heal them. So I think we theologically have a way of dealing with this question. If you want to ask more questions about this, this is a great topic to ask questions about. And I think there are, you know, Christians have wrestled with this for a long time. And I think there are some really good answers. I, I just don't have time to go into uh, them more now. But feel free to, to start more conversations about that question. Because I wanted to get to this. Um, is there really good scientific evidence for human evolution? And yes, there is. There's multiple mutually reinforcing lines of evidence for human evolution. Uh, humans share common ancestries with the animals. Uh, 
most recently about roughly seven million years ago with, uh, with several primate species and going back further with all mammals and then with, with the whole uh, tree of life. Um, there's a lot of genetic evidence for that. There's a lot of evidence in developmental biology and anatomy and so forth. And um, there's a lot of evidence for an evolutionary development over the last several million years of a, of a seri series of species, of, mo of branching bushes of, of interrelated species, uh, one path of which led to Homo sapiens going back millions of years. Um, you know, go back about two million years roughly, you see somewhere in between Homo habilis twice the size of a brain, roughly, of a modern chimp and half the size of modern humans and, and use some tone tools and we see this development. And throughout that million year history, some of those sent off, um, some, some moved into Europe and Asia. You've heard of Neanderthals and maybe Denisovans. That's all part of the story. Human ancestral population, as far as we can tell, has always been more than two individuals. Um, if you're not familiar with this line of reasoning, um, a, something I learned as, as a, a way to illustrate this is, uh, imagine you have an island somewhere and you put two dogs on it, male and female, and they have puppies and then several generations pass and 200 years later you come back and there's a thousand dogs on that island. But there wouldn't be a lot of genetic diversity because pretty much all the genes in that final population aside from mutations would have come from that first single pair. Go to another island at the same starting point and start it with 100 dogs, 50 males, 50 females, and they have offspring and so on for 200 years, and at the end there's 1,000 there. And you would see a lot more genetic diversity in that second island because you would have had a much bigger population at that sort of uh, point, at one particular point in time where their ancestral population was at a, at a, at a bottleneck. Um, and you can actually do computer modeling of this. And uh, the computer modeling, when looked at human genetic diversity, pretty strongly says that we, all of humans today, do not descend from just two individuals. The smallest population seems to have always been at least a few thousand individuals going back, spread out geographically, uh, over, over um, going back a long ways. Um, okay, so what about what were our ancestors like? Um, well, some of the oldest Homo sapiens fossils, uh, this line finally leading to us going about million years a year, a year, you start to find identifiably Homo sapiens looking a bit archaic about 300,000 years ago, and, and some of them actually had small uh, migrations out of Africa into Europe and Asia, but about 70,000 years ago, it looks like there was a fairly large migration out of Africa. And that population sort of spread over the globe, and some of them mixed with Neanderthals along the way, and Denisovans and other species who were descended from an ancestral species, uh, Homo erectus, from about seven, eight hundred thousand years ago, uh, when that offspring. So still able to interbreed Neanderthals and Homo sapiens back then, and. Our ancestral population was spread all over the globe, including the Americas, well before 15,000 years ago. A few other things we learned is um, at some point in the story, gene culture coevolution becomes important. I'm going to have to go really fast on this, but you should learn about this. Um, at some point, it's not just genes that are evolving, it's culture, human culture of, of our ancestors, um, developing greater language, training of the young people, how to use fire to cook, how, you know, passing on knowledge from generation to generation of how to find food locally, and also how to behave, how to live in a society, in a, in a, in a tribal group, in a way where you and the whole group can thrive. There's cultures that develop, and the development of culture affects the development of genes and vice versa. Um, it looks like uh, what we would think of as human abilities. We have like linguistic complexity and ability to, complex, to cooperate across really huge groups over large distances far beyond other animals. Um, those kinds of capabilities, yes, they're, they're, they're distinctive in humans, but there doesn't seem to be a unique particular starting point. It looks like they developed gradually. And as I mentioned before, um, it looks, we know today that we sometimes treat each other nice and sometimes treat each other nasty, and it looks like our ancestors were doing the same all the way back. All right, so 
If we're saying that, and I am saying, there's a lot of good evidence for that, and as a Christian, I would affirm that, now, that, that the scientific evidence is good, so I would say that, yes, God used evolutionary processes, used these evolutionary processes to, in our ancestors to bring about the human species. Now we're going to shift over to theology, and for most of the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking more uh, based on the theology I've learned by, by trying to read what uh, theologians have said. One of the questions often asked, or two of the questions, is what about the soul? What about the image of God? How did that fit with evolution? I'm actually not going to go into that much. I'm just going to say that if you look through church history, you'll see multiple theological theories about what it doesn't mean for humans to have souls, and multiple theological theories for what does it mean for humans to be created in the image of God. And our next speaker is actually much more an expert on that, so I'm going to defer a lot of that to him. I'll just say this from my perspective, that what Christian theology says about these topics, uh, we can have all of that compatible with God giving humanity our abilities through evolutionary process, plus this thing I mentioned about at some point God beginning to have special revelation coming to human beings in a variety of ways, whether that's through the voice of conscience, through the voice of, a, of a, an inspired teacher, through a direct verbal revelation, however special revelation might happen. Um, I think we can get everything that Christian theology needs from those. Um, we can also talk about other kinds of miracles here, but I'm actually not going to. I want to defer a discussion of these particular topics to our next speaker or questions you might have. Uh, I want to sp uh, spend a little bit more time on this because this is what motivated my book. If, in fact, it looks like, and I think we have good reason to believe God used evolutionary processes to create humanity, how did sin, that theological term I introduced earlier, I'll try and summarize it now, disobedience against God's revealed will and God's revealed desire for human flourishing, how does that then enter the story? And remember what I said, I think there's multiple possibilities. And I'm going to start right now to really play into that theme of multiple possibilities. One question people often want to know is, well, what do you do with Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and 3? If you think that God used evolutionary processes. And I've read a bunch of books which propose something like the following. Well, we could see Adam and Eve as a particular pair of historical individuals, probably not by that name, probably not living in Mesopotamia, probably not 7,000 years ago, but there was a particular historical pair of individuals who received, out of a larger population, who received a particular revelation and a, made a particular rejection of God, and that was sort of the first historical sin, and their offspring then mixed with the rest of it. So we're, not, we're all descended from them, but also lots of others who were alive at the time. So that's an idea that a lot of Christians play with. But I have also read a lot of Christian theologians uh, and, and biblical scholars who say, actually, we think a better interpretation of Genesis is to see Adam and Eve as archetypal symbolic figures, literary figures, who uh, actually represent many individuals or even our whole ancestral population sort of having a rebellion against God over a long period of time. Um, I'm going to defer more discussion of that also to our next speaker. I will just say this. Um, for both those types of answers, I think you can make some pros and cons for each of those. There's specific theological reasons you might like one, theological reasons you might prefer the other. There's pros and cons, and they're out there. We're going to put them on the table for more discussion. I think both types can work. Some might be better than others. Some are better than others, but um, I, I want them on the table for discussion. A few other questions you might ask. Uh, how long ago did this happen, right? Should we try to date the first human rebellion against God way back when, millions of years ago, when our ancestors might just barely be possible of forming the concept of, I have a relationship with you, I can hurt you, and I know that when I do that, I am hurting another being like myself, and also there's this other idea we have of God, and that's part of the story too. Or should we go a little further, where our gene culture evolution has gone a little further, concepts are more sophisticated, language is more sophisticated, maybe 200,000 years ago. Maybe you want to go all the way to 10,000 years ago, relatively recently. You know, humans would be spread all over the world by then, and uh, being nice and nasty to each other. But maybe some people would say, some people do say, all of these proposals are out there in books, well, maybe it waited, God knew that people were being nice and nasty, but God didn't call it sin 
until a particular kind of revelation came to a particular group of people, and that was the point at which they achieved a level of responsibility where you might call it sin. These are options out there, and I will say, this will almost become a joke in a couple of slides. There are reasons to favor every one of these uh, reasons, reasons to question every one of them. There's pros and cons for each answer. Um, how did sin spread from those first sinners? I'm going to throw out four options that are out there, try and go through them really fast. Uh, was it that our first sinners were somehow like legal representatives, and when they sinned, then the fact that everybody else was being nasty started to count as sin too? Some proposed something like that. They have specific scriptural reasons they like that. Um, what about cultural spreading? I mean, we know that bad ideas and bad behavior can certainly spread culturally by learning. We see that today. It certainly could have and almost certainly did happen among our ancestors. Is that how sin as rebellion against God spread? What about parents to offspring? Whoever the first sinners were, their offsprings then mixed with all others were all descended from them now. Or what about developmentally? Here analogy would be, okay, so when a little infant is crying because it's not getting something at once right now, we don't call that sin. Uh, when a toddler throws a tantrum for not getting something the toddler wants, and you look at the glint in the kid's eye, and you say, yeah, that kid is willfully sinning, right? Um, but where's the boundary line? We don't know. I mean, it seems to be a developmental process into that status for children today. So maybe also with our ancestors. Four options out there in the literature, in the, in the books you can read out there, pros and cons for each of them. I think they all have something to recommend them, something to make you wonder if they're right. Um, I think that's exciting. I can throw out different questions. There's a long chapter in my book where I try to go through this. Uh, that very first sin was general revelation, conscience, reason, empathy enough to tell humans, now you're sinning, or did it have to wait for some sort of special revelation from God? You can read advocates of both answers. Um, just how righteous were those first sinners when they sinned? Were they somehow fully mature and righteous? Were they sort of a childlike innocence? Maybe if you push sin all the way back, barely out of animal innocence? Or, or some sort of legal innocence where, yeah, they were doing wrong things, but it wasn't counted as sin? Uh, all interesting possibilities, theological options on the table that theolo serious theologians propose. Um, and the damage caused by sin, did it primarily happen via one act as... as um, so, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, um, St. Thomas Aquinas or, or um, other theologians have proposed? Um, or was it an accumulation of damage caused by many acts? For all of those questions, there are specific theological uh, reasons to think about them, pros and cons for each. And here's one of the hardest questions. Um, yeah, do we think humans could have avoided sinning? Do we think our ancestors actually had a serious chance of avoiding rebelling against God? Or do we think it was somehow inevitable? Um, that actually question goes way back before humans talked about human evolution. That goes back centuries and centuries in church theological thought. Um, because it touches on some of the very hardest questions. And I think it's a good question to get raised again in this context. And again, for both of those answers, there's specific pros and cons for each. So, yes, let me argue why this is good. <clears throat> When I'm, as a scientist, or as a member of a group of scientists, and I'm in a situation where I have some interesting data, and I have multiple theories on the table that could potentially explain it, I think that's exciting. I don't see that as a sign of fear. I see it as a sign to do more work. Uh, that there's progress to be made by thinking about this problem further. As we spend more time studying it, we might reject some of the theories on the table, we might add some new to the table, but our understanding of the issues will almost certainly grow as we put more effort into studying it. And I think that's the situation we're in today. I think that's exciting, and I think it's reassuring. If you sort of came here tonight wondering, well, as a Christian, I'm, I'm worried about the scientific evolution, uh, scientific evidence for human evolution, that it might sort of upset Christian theology. There's a lot of options on the table, okay? You really don't have to fear, as science develops, science, development of science might rule out some of the possibilities I put on the table. Others, others are, are quite robust. All right, so 
Yeah, I'm leaving us with a lot of questions and why I think it's a good question. Um, but I think we have limited data on it. And uh, it's worth thinking about. It's worth making, spending more time on. But I think the most important question we can ask right now is, what is God doing about it? And here I hope I and Professor Middleton will say a little bit more. Here I think scripture has a lot more to say. Remember when I said earlier what God's rescue plan was? Here I think scripture's kind of unambiguous about it. Yeah, um, the reason I think sin is an important topic is because I think sin is something that, my own sin is something that would keep me away from God. I, I could not stand to be near God in my sinful presence. But God has a plan, and I don't fully understand it, but I think there's good reason to think that God went to all this trouble with Jesus Christ, the incarnation, the life, the death, the resurrection, and then inviting me to be part of it. I think that's God's rescue plan, and I think that is, uh, that's a lot more clear to me. So that's all for now. And I would ask for questions, except instead, I'm going to turn it over to our other speaker now and try and help him. Thank you. Good evening. It is a delight to be here with you. I am privileged to be part of this Veritas Forum. And I want to thank the planners and the organizers and all who have made it possible, especially Professor Harzma and his presentation for kicking off this event. So let me start with a question. Can faithful Christians affirm the distinctive biblical view of humanity in Genesis 1 as created in God's image and yet hold to an evolutionary account of human origins? It's just thinking, oh, you got to connect it. There you go. Okay, I do have one. Great. All right, perfect. On the face of it, this seems like a difficult problem to answer, but even more difficult, perhaps, is reconciling what evolutionary science suggests about human origins and the biblical picture of the origin of evil, the fall, as recounted in the narrative in Genesis 2 and chapter 3. Now, this is not the first time that Christians have had to adapt their interpretation of the Bible to new discoveries of science. For example, the Bible assumes a flat earth, as Professor Harzman said, with the sun, moon, and stars up there in the dome of the heavens, pictures as a roof overhead, and the cosmic waters both above the dome and below the earth. Now we affirm uncontroversially heliocentrism, that the sun is the center of the solar system and the earth revolves around the sun, and the earth is a planet, unless of course you're a flat earther, which I hope there's nobody here. But, uh, Almost all of my students simply assume that when they read Genesis 1, um, the earth is a planet, something no biblical author ever thought. That doesn't prevent me from believing the earth is a planet. And we now come to grips with the idea that the sun is only one star among trillions of stars in a galaxy that's itself one among many galaxies in an expanding universe. But the issue of human evolution seems a little more problematic than heliocentrism or even an expanding universe. The current science dates our oldest possible hominin ancestor, Saleanthropus tacadensis, to about six or seven million years ago. The Australopithecines, including the famous nickname Lucy, appear in the fossil record three to four million years ago. And then Homo habilis, the earliest well-known example of the genus Homo, is thought to have lived 1.5 to two million years ago. Current estimates for anatomically modern Homo sapiens put their origins at about 300,000 years ago. Interesting, 10 years ago we thought it was 200,000 years ago. The science is changing rapidly with new discoveries. And it's thought that as a minimum, there were a few thousand in the population needed to explain current genetic diversity. See, we actually agree on some things here. <laughs> so this is a good test, right? The, the evidence corroborates. And yet, we have Genesis 2, which recounts God's creation of an initial human pair, not a large population group, with no reference to earlier human ancestors. And the claim of evolutionary descent seems to, on the surface, contradict the biblical idea of humans being unique, which is usually associated with our being created as the image of God. Now, unlike some Christians who had to be convinced of the validity of biological evolution later in their life, I have no memory of ever dismissing evolution as fundamentally incompatible with my Christian faith. 
I became a Christian at a young age, and I accepted in my teenage years that the earth was very old, based on the best evidence. And as a young adult, I read avidly books on hominin evolution, then called hominid evolution. Terminology has changed, including the discovery of Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, because they were playing Lucy in the sky with diamonds when they dug up her, <laughs> her bones. However, I was somewhat troubled that evolution did not seem compatible with the biblical idea of the fall, the origin of evil recounted in Genesis 2 and 3. I had always been taught that the text portrays Adam and Eve, an original couple, forfeiting a primal paradisical state through a single act of disobedience, which led to the introduction of death in the sense of mortality for both humans and the natural world. And I couldn't get my head around how this might fit with what scientists claimed about human evolution. So I did what many Christians do when confronted with cognitive dissonance. I put it out of my mind and concentrated on other things. In my case, these were my graduate studies, first a master's degree in philosophy at the University of Guelph in Canada, and I wrote a thesis on the nature of religious language, and then in the field of Old Testament studies at the master's level and the PhD level. My doctoral studies led to this book called The Liberating Image, the Imago Dei in Genesis 1, and I've written a lot of articles, book chapters, and encyclopedia entries, and blog posts on the idea that we are made in God's image. So I'm kind of invested in this idea. Then over the last few years, I found myself working more and more on the story of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 and 3, a very profound and earthy story about human identity and origins, including the identity and origins of evil. And I've now published a couple of essays on these chapters and some blog posts, one of the essays in a book called Evolution and the Fall, I love the cover. And I have a contract to write a book called Life and Death in the Garden of Eden, though not right away because I have a couple other book contracts to get through first. In what follows, I'm going to draw upon my expertise as an Old Testament scholar who has been teaching and writing about biblical creation texts for many years, though until recently without any explicit reference to evolution. Biblical scholars are a little different from theologians. Theologians are interested in big ideas. Biblical scholars pay attention to the details of texts. So I'm going to immerse you in some textual details here tonight. And I'm going to suggest that I've come to discern a number of ways in which these biblical texts, while certainly not meant to teach science, can prime us theologically in terms of our worldview to be open to what evolutionary science tells us about human evolution. I actually believe, you might think I'm crazy, that paying better attention to the Bible might make better theological sense of evolution. Yeah, go ahead. You can throw some tomatoes now. All right? So let's start with what's often taken to be a major contra contradiction between the Bible and evolution, namely God's creation of an initial human pair, Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 2. There are two problems with thinking that this contradicts an evolutionary account of human origins. The first is while we often think of the first human pair in Genesis 2 as Adam and Eve, the text originally designates them as the human, Ha-Adam, and the woman, Ha-Isha, this Hebrew. Adam becomes a proper name really only in Genesis chapter 5, and Eve is the name given to the woman in Genesis 3.20. And what are we to make of the fact that the name of the first man is human, Adam, and the name of the first woman, Chava, sounds like the word for life in Hebrew, because she's the mother of all living. And who would name their son Abel, which means vapor or futility, the same word that occurs as a theme in Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. That's one problem. Second problem is that there are actually two different accounts of creation in the early chapters of Genesis. Let's compare Genesis 2 with Genesis 1, where God creates not individuals, but population groups to fill various niches, including f flying creatures in the sky, swimming things in the water, then animals on the land, and also human beings, designated by the collective noun Adam on the land. Now, Christians only read this account of human creation as an original couple because we tend to retroject the account from Genesis 2 back into Genesis 1. But I think we should respect the different portrayals of creation in each chapter. 
Beyond the question of the initial population size, there's a different portrayal of the initial state of the world in these two texts. Genesis 1 begins with the earth inundated with water, so that God has to separate the waters for the dry land to appear. Genesis 2 is different. There the earth is originally a dry wilderness, so that plants cannot grow until a mist rises to bring water to the ground. Then, there's a different creative order of the events in chapters 1 and 2. In Genesis 2, the order is dry land, then water, then a human, Adam, later specified as a man, then plants, animals, and a woman. In Genesis 1, the order of these very same items is water, then dry land, then animals, then humans, Adam, same term, consisting in male and female together. In neither case is the text teaching science, for then we'd have to ask which account is scientifically true, or as Christians like to put it, which account is literally true. The point is, they're different, but they teach a harmonious view of what it means to be human. And in this view, humans are defined both by our commonality with other animals and by the distinction of being created in the image of God, Latin imago dei. In popular thought, the image of God is often taken as referring to certain features or capacities that we have that distinguish us from animals. For example, rationality. But that's not the way the Bible typically talks about the image of God. Old Testament scholars today are pretty united in seeing the image of God not as certain distinctive capacities that humans have, but as our ethical calling or a vocation of representing God on earth by manifesting God's presence in all of life. My, my image for this is we are the prism of God. The bright light of God shines through us and is refracted. So the image of God is both a gift God has given humans to represent God on earth, which affirms our dignity, but also the calling to manifest that representation by the way we exercise power, both towards other people in love and how we interact with the earth to transform it and develop culture. What evolutionists would call niche construction, but doing this in a way that lovingly cares for the non-human world. It's because of Jesus' own use of power for the benefit of others that he's described in the New Testament as the perfect image of God. He represented God perfectly in his life. Now, of course, to be, to, to be a representative of God in the world, humans need to have certain kinds of capacities or faculties, like rationality, language, sociability, and so forth. And the Bible does, in fact, distinguish us from animals in rather common sense ways. Humans are granted dominion over animal life, and not vice versa. Animals simply cannot meet the deepest human needs for interpersonal fellowship. God had to create a woman for the man. Yet, the Bible also presents a picture of significant continuity between humans and other animals. To start with, humans and other land animals are created on the same day in Genesis 1, day 6. We don't get our own special day. Then, in Genesis 2, the human, Ha-Adam, is created from the ground or the soil, the Hebrew Ha-Adama. That's a pun. That's intentional wordplay in Hebrew, signifying the human status as a groundling or an earth creature. An English pun would be the human is made from the humus. That's a crucial theological point the Bible makes in chapter 2. We are earth beings. Genesis 2 goes on to tell us that animals are also created from the ground, which testifies to a fundamental human-animal commonality or kinship. Both humans and other animals are described by the identical human phrase, translated differently in Bibles often, nefesh chaya. What does that term mean? Well, let's look at this. In Genesis 2.7, after God created the human being, Adam, from the dust of the Ha'adama, God breathed into the human being the breath of life, and the human became a nefesh chaya which the King James Version famously translates as a living soul. So instead of having a soul, as later Christian tradition comes to affirm via Plato, a human in the Old Testament is a soul, a nefesh, indeed a living nefesh. A good translation of nefesh chaya would be something like a living organism. 
Although this phrase, nefesh haya, is used both of humans and animals in Genesis 2, many Bible translations render it a little differently when it's used of humans in verse 7 and of animals later in the chapter, verse 19, in an attempt, I think, to distinguish humans from animals. But this betrays a fundamental misunderstanding of the biblical assumption of a commonality between humans and animals. The word soul in the Bible, the Hebrew nefesh, or the Greek suche, actually indicates not our distinctiveness, but precisely what we share in common with animals. Some of you might be disappointed that I'm not going to defend the idea that we're different from animals because we have souls. Well, as the man in black said to Inigo Montoya in The Princess Bride, get used to disappointment. The fact that the Bible portrays the commonality, even the kinship between humans and a variety of other animals, should, I believe, predispose Christians who take the Bible seriously to at least be open to considering the idea of common evolutionary descent. But isn't the tension between human evolution and the biblical idea of the fall or original sin in a different category altogether? In particular, Christians with integrity can they maintain the historicity of the fall, that is the origin of moral evil or sin, as an event that really happened in history? If so, can we describe in what sense it happened in evolutionary terms? It's always been important for me that the Bible claimed that the world God created was good, indeed very good, and that evil was later introduced into this world by human disobedience. The notion of a historical fall, which denies a pre-existing principle of evil and lays the origin of evil clearly at the feet of human beings, distinguishes the biblical vision of creation from other accounts of origins, as many scholars have pointed out. Yet it's become common among many Christian proponents of evolutionary creation to deny the classical doctrine of a historical fall and claim that Homo sapiens emerged sinful. But I don't think that's a necessary move for those of us who want to affirm the truth of the Bible and evolutionary accounts of human origins. I think part of the problem is what we mean by the word historical. For some, this means a punctilia or singular event perpetrated by an original couple that automatically changed human nature and made it evil, such that every person born in the world after comes into the world with a sin nature. But that particular interpretation of the fall, a version of original sin, as Augustine formulated it, is not the only way to read the Genesis story. So what I'm going to do is assume what I've already argued, that Genesis is not incontrovertibly committed to the idea of two original humans. It allows us to think either of a large population group, Genesis 1, or of Ha-Adam, the human being, in Genesis 2, as archetypal of all people everywhere. This might mean that the narrative of disobedience in Genesis 3 is not simply about a single event in the past, though I don't exclude that, but it describes what is typical in the process of temptation and sin in human experience. Indeed, it's a profound phenomenology of how sin works. In fact, when preachers, at least good preachers, expound the garden story in Genesis 2 and 3, they tend to emphasize how this is true for all of us. Adam and Eve are archetypal of what it means to be human, rather than locating this as one event somewhere in the distant past. So if we're open to viewing the garden narrative in this manner, the dialogue between the woman and the snake in Genesis can be seen as a profound study in the phenomenology of temptation and sin which may be applied not just to our own individual experiences of temptation and sin, but also to the early experience of Homo sapiens. So you ready for a deep dive? Hang on to your hats. The temptation begins with a question from the snake about whether eating from all the trees of the garden was really prohibited. It's a trick question, because they weren't all prohibited, right? The question accurately depicts, though, the way temptation comes to a person. It seems to arise from an external source. Note, the snake is not intrinsically evil. According to the text, it is one of the wild animals the Lord God made and the man named. So the origin of temptation isn't necessarily something evil, but precisely as Professor Harzma said, something good which has been disordered. So it could be some aspect of God's good world that becomes the occasion for sin. And that's quite a profound point. 
In both the snake's question and the woman's response, there are a number of cases of what I would call slippage, from what the narrator says, all of which ring true to our experience of temptation. The narrator consistently uses the, the, the compound name Lord God, in Hebrew, Yahweh Elohim, to designate the Creator throughout the, the, the narrative in Genesis 2 and 3. But the snake speaks about God only, Elohim, leaving out the divine name Yahweh, and the woman follows suit in her response. The covenantal name Yahweh revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai is not used anywhere in the conversation, which, as many Jewish scholars have pointed out, is probably a distancing tactic serving to disasso the pro dis disassociate the prohibition from Israel's covenant God, the God with whom one can have a personal ethical relationship. Beyond that, the narrator's reference to Yahweh God commanding has been softened to God saying in the snake's question. Here again, the woman follows the snake's lead. You never ever read it that closely, did you? Well, I'm a biblical scholar, so I'm reading very closely. But in contrast to this distancing and softening, you find that the woman adds to the prohibition against eating from the tree when she says that you shall not touch it or you shall die, something that the Creator never prohibited. Nothing was said, you can't touch the tree. Then comes further slippage in the woman's answer to the snake when she modifies the warning that Yahweh God gave about the consequences of disobedience. The original warning, and by the way, not all translations render this accurately, was that in the day that you eat of the forbidden tree, you will surely die. But the woman omits the reference to the day, which suggested immediate consequences, and describes the consequence simply as, you'll die, leaving out a particular Hebrew grammatical construction which refers to intensity or certainty. From initially questioning the woman about whether eating any of the trees in the garden was permitted, the snake finally outrightly denies that they will die while trying to make the Creator seem stingy. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. This entire conversation is a profound representation of the inner dialogue of conscience, first questioning God's Word, in fact, distancing it from Israel's covenant God, then softening the prohibition, then overstating it, perhaps in compensation for softening it, then toning down the consequences, then outrightly denying the consequences, and finally questioning God's motive. And the conversation ends up sowing the seeds of doubt in the woman's mind concerning God's generosity, resulting in a lack of trust in God's intentions for humanity. And then both she and the man who was with her the whole time eat the forbidden fruit. The entire conversation realistically depicts the way temptation works, either as an intrahuman psychological process or as an interhuman communal process. And this would be applicable either to each person throughout history wrestling with the call of conscience or to an original fall among Homo sapiens at some point in the past. Many Christians assume that the Garden of Eden story includes a period prior to sin when the first humans lived innocently in a paradise-like state, la -di da among the animals eating you know, delicious fruit and so forth and fanning themselves with peacock feathers. You can see these kind of pictures all over the place. However, it turns out there was no actual narration of such a period in the book of Genesis. At the end of Genesis 2, the woman is created to be a helper or partner for the man presumably means that she's to help him in the task of working and guarding the garden. But instead of portraying the first humans fulfilling their very purpose for being, the narrative rushes to tell of their disobedience, introducing the serpent, the snake. The idea of a paradisical period in Eden is much more a function of Christian assumptions than it is of anything in the actual text. The question I wondered is, could the immediate transition from the creation of the first humans in Genesis 2 to the primal transgression in Genesis 3 be significant for our thinking about the possibly limited time span between the rise of moral and religious consciousness in Homo sapiens and the onset of sin in the human population? Not only is there no paradisical period in these chapters, but the human nature doesn't seem to suffer any sort of immediate and radical corruption as the classic doctrine of original sin might suggest, such that everybody afterwards inherits a sin nature. 
This does not mean there are no changes narrated in Genesis 3, but there are existential and behavioral changes. Humans immediately acquire a sense of shame at their nakedness and a fear of God leading to their hiding, which fulfills the warning that in the day you eat of it, something's going to happen. God doesn't have to say anything. Human consciousness has changed. And then God announces certain consequences for sin, including new difficulties in the relationships between people and the ground. Farming becomes excessively toilsome. There's also difficulties of women in childbearing. Even conception will become difficult. Difficulties also then um, between women and men. An asymmetry of power begins. A lack of reciprocity begins to creep into relationships. In many ways, human life goes out of whack. And finally, God announces that the humans have become like God, knowing good and evil, in an inappropriate way, which we can talk about in our discussion time, in a way which will not be good for them. And here it's helpful, I think, to counterbalance the classical idea of original sin, which often assumes that all post-fall humans come into the world enslaved by sin, with the actual narration of the development of sin in Genesis 4 and later in Genesis 6. The initial transgression of the parents develops in the next generation into murder as Cain kills Abel. But that's not a necessary progression. The narrative portrays Cain's struggle with anger and depression leading up to murder, including God's claim that he can do well. And although sin is lurking at the door, he must master it. God's words to Cain suggest that sin, the first time this word is ever used in the Bible, is not inevitable for human beings at this stage in their existence. It can at least be resisted initially. So rather than an immediate change in human nature, the narrative portrays a process by which humans come more and more under the sway of sin. After Cain's murder, we find Lamech's revenge killing of a young man who injured him, a killing he boasts about to his two wives. Yet even here, the growth of sin is intertwined with positive cultural innovation, such as the building of cities, the invention of new forms of livestock tending, musical instruments, metal tools. Humans create all kinds of good things, but sin continues to infect the human race until every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil continually and the earth was destroyed or ruined. Hebrew shachat, sounds like shattering a jar, right? By the violence with which humans filled it. You only have to look around the world today to see that Genesis 6 is true of the world today. So we finally, in Genesis chapter 6, have something as pervasive as original sin in the later theological sense of the term. A situation of communal and systemic evil that we're all born into, but this is a historical progression and not a genetic inheritance. So you see, I, I come down on certain of those um, points of view and not others. Such a developmental and communal view of sin as narrated in Genesis is true to human experience and is quite compatible with the evolution of religious and moral consciousness among human beings. Although we can't know for sure exactly when Homo sapiens first became aware of the prodding of conscience, or indeed if it was some previous genus, uh, species of Homo that became first aware, I think it probably was Homo sapiens, we can speculate that at some point God entered into a relationship with some representative population of early humans, get, making them aware that there was an ethical call on their lives to live as a divine image in the world. This new relationship with the concomitant ethical, ethical call would have engendered a significant change in the consciousness of Homo sapiens and their behavior. Let me explain. We know from experience that relationships change us, sometimes decisively. No one who enters into a marriage or becomes a parent is the same after, at least if we take that relationship seriously. Do I hear an amen? I think you know what I'm talking about. Even our pets change us, as pet owners will be aware of also. And evolutionary biologists have discussed how various human-animal relationships may have led to significant adaptations in human behavior. Being in a relationship puts certain explicit or implicit demands on us, and as we respond to the other, we begin to change over time, not just in our actions, but in our thinking and in our values. We now know that behavioral changes begin to lay down new neural pathways in the brain, 
we literally become different people over time. It's therefore plausible to think that the rise of moral consciousness was a decisive development among anatomically modern Homo sapiens, who've been around for nearly 300,000 years. When did this occur? 100,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago? Scientists speculate on what's called the great leap forward in human consciousness. There's evidence of that in the archeological record. I think whenever that happened, it resulted from a developing awareness of God's call to a certain moral form of life. And it's plausible to think that it was not long before these humans began to go against the new revelations of conscience, and thus sin was introduced into the world. And both moral consciousness and sinful resistance then spread to all homo sapiens. While this may not be the fall as a singular act perpetuated by an original couple, Adam and Eve, it's still a temporal event in history, a historical fall, which took place among early humans. Of course, that's total speculation. It's an open question what the best scenario is for understanding the origin of moral evil among early Homo sapiens. And as, <clears throat> as Professor Harzman suggests, more than one scenario is compatible with a biblical understanding of these early chapters of Genesis. I personally don't find the Bible most useful for this kind of speculation. Rather, the scriptures teach us theological and ethical truths, truths about God and ourselves. They affirm the high dignity and nobility of being human. We are made in God's image, along with the undeniable reality that we are capable of great evil, which we perpetuate against each other, against the earth itself and the non-human creatures of the earth, and even to our own detriment against ourselves. The author C.S. Lewis articulates the paradox of being human, this dignity and also great evil, in his novel of Narnia called Prince Caspian. In the novel, Lewis has a Christ figure, Aslan the Lion, make a profound statement to Caspian, who's struggling with his sense of identity. You come of the Lord Adam and the Lady Eve, said Aslan, and that is both honor enough to erect the head of the poorest beggar and shame enough to bow the shoulders of the greatest emperor on earth. I, for one, am very glad that the Bible does not just expose our problem, the problem of our shameful behavior. It also affirms that the creator of the universe came to us as a human being. The word became flesh. Interesting, the word didn't become a human being. It became flesh, identifying with all organic creatures. <clears throat> and he came to share our mortality and our suffering in order to make a way for our redemption, our restoration to wholeness and flourishing. For me, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harsima and Dr. Milton, for sharing um, some of your knowledge with us. So we wanted to save the last bit of the forum tonight, open for questions, and as we said, uh, our question and response. Uh, we are calling this a question and response, not a question and answer, because uh, we don't necessarily have the answers. Um, so does anyone have a question that they would like to ask one of our speakers? I'll, I'll start you guys off uh, on something. Um, so, Dr. Milton, you talked a lot about whether or not the original couple was indeed a single couple, or a, a single Adam, a single Eve. And Dr. Harshma, you also want to mention similar things, such as evolutionarily, um, the likelihood there was likely a lot of people. I'm curious to how do you think about or reconcile that with parts of New Testament scripture? So, for example, Romans 5, where um, Paul talks about uh, Adam and Christ, and the idea that through one man sin entered the world, and comparing Christ to Adam as through one man salvation comes to the world. How do you, how do you um, interpret and read that scripture then? You want me to try? You want to try? We, Go ahead. I'll, I'll, talk and you, I'll talk and you can think, and then okay. it's fine. fine. Do I have to turn this on? Uh, yeah, there's just a... Um, I'll give you a chance. So um, I, that's a very good question. I've been asked it before. In my book, I tried to channel some New Testament scholars that I've read. Um, some have proposed the idea that, well, um, to our modern ears, it sounds like Paul is sort of teaching that there was one man, Adam, but uh, <clears throat> we're not, we can't necessarily be sure that's what Paul thought. Uh, 
I might say something like the following, um, that uh, early American um, relationships with the wilderness of, and particularly forests, can be represented by Paul Bunyan and Johnny Appleseed. Now, what's going on there? Uh, if you know American mythology, you know Paul Bunyan is a mythical figure who represents lots of lumberjacks who went out into the wilderness and cut down trees. And Johnny Appleseed is a different name for an actual person of a different name, who, but a real historical person who went around planting trees. Um, now, a modern American who knows all of the stories there would know what I just did. Somebody reading that story 200 years from now might think that Lauren Harsma believed that Paul Bunyan was a historical figure. So we could be, um, we could be uh, at, at, a, at a sort of distance from Paul. There's another answer which I think more New Testament scholars like, and that goes back to my slide to accommodation. If God could inspire Old Testament authors to uh, teach theological truths about God while interlacing it with language that implied that, yeah, they believed the earth was flat and not moving, but still, God inspired that scripture to teach truths they needed to hear. God could have also worked that way with Paul, even if Paul did think Adam was a single person, father of every single human being, and inspired Paul to teach theological truths that had to be made. I would say something similar. I just commented about Johnny Appleseed. You know why he was planting these trees, right? To get hard cider, so people get drunk because farming was very difficult and people were in pain. Because on, it's only recently the cider is not hard cider. All ancient cider is always hard. Anyway, that's another question. So, so, so your mythology about Johnny Appleseed, you've got to think about that. Um, so yeah, I, whether or not Paul believed Adam was an individual person, the progenitor of the human race, to me is not the most important question. It's what is taught through that idea. So I don't have to believe what particular biblical authors believed about the world to get the theological point God is making through them. And that's an important distinction that we have to make. Just one other little detail. Some people say, but Paul's whole theology depends on it being a single person, right? Because Christ, is, he says, as in Adam, all die. As in Christ, all are made alive. So it needs a, Christ is a single person, so Adam needs to be a single person. But if you took that very literalistically, which is different from the word literally, literally means what the author intended. Literalistically means the way we modern people use the word literal, we'll get, to, we'll get to that in a moment. If we took that really literalistically, then Paul is saying that because Christ came, every single person in the world is saved. If we're all descended from Adam, then we're all saved because of Christ. But that's not what he's actually saying either. So it's much more nuanced. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How far back does the Jewish rabbinical view of the Bible as composed of four modes go? In Hebrew, Peshat, Drash, Remez, and Sod. Is that as old as the time of Jesus? No, it's maybe about a thousand years old. It's a medieval idea out of Jewish mysticism, the Zohar. Okay, yeah. so not, not quite. I mean, there's, there's precursors of it before, but they're all post-biblical. Anyone else? Other questions? Yeah. So, would you guys say that um, free will, not to get into like super big <laughs> discussions, but would that be like kind of central to um, God's plan, or well, God's plan being separate from our free will? What do you mean? Say a little um, more. Like our free will to sin, to choose to listen to our like different parts of our conscious that may tell us to do good or nasty things like um he was alluding to mm -hmm. sorry I don't know if that's good. I'll, I'll give it a shot so um i like to sort of look at again uh, church history on that there are theologians of the past who would sort of not make a big deal out of free will and not worry about that and they would have a sense of god's sovereignty implying, yeah, God knew there would be a fall all along, and that was part of it. That's probably a minority view in, in church history going all the way back. I think most Christians take a view of free will more like, I think, what you have in mind, that God gave us free will. And there's a sort of a classic theological answer. Why did God create humans with a capability 
with the possibility of sinning? And the answer was, well, God wanted creatures who could freely choose. And this was important to God's purpose. God wanted to develop creatures who could freely choose, freely understand what self-sacrificial love was, and choose to participate in that or choose to go another way. And God valued that so much that God couldn't then say, I make you capable of freely choosing and then dictate everything they do. Um, so in, in that sense, free will would have been, been part of God's plan, even though God would have known what, we would, what some of us would choose to do with that. I don't claim to know what God valued in that quite way, but um, certainly it seems to me that humans have always had some degree of freedom. I don't believe free will is an absolute. I, I believe that our freedom is constrained in all kinds of ways. Um, actually physically constrained, but also psychologically constrained and morally constrained. So nobody has truly absolute freedom. Um, as philosophers of ethics will tell you, when you are little, when you are young, you have many possibilities open to you. In a sense, you have more freedom. As you get older, certain things are closed off to you because of your, your developmental process. You become more specialized, but you have less things you can do. So freedom becomes more limited. But that in itself shows you that freedom is not the greatest thing. Virtue is the greatest thing. Freedom is to lead to virtue. But that, that doesn't really answer your question, but I want to add that to, to this discussion. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? I'm just curious now that both of you have heard each of your other's presentation. At the beginning, I was thinking there might be some more uh, conflict between your two views, but it seemed to me that they're actually uh, quite complementary. So I'm curious uh, of each of your reaction to the other's talks. That's a good point. I, I love the presentation. Um, people who've read my book have complained that I lay out all these different multiple way, multiple possibilities, and they can't tell which one I like. And that, and that was deliberate on my point part. And I, I can explain why afterwards, why, why I chose to do that. But then sometimes they ask, well, secretly, which, which one is your favorite? And, and I'm willing to say, uh, and I guess I'll say publicly, my favorite is very, very close to the, way, the one you laid out. So. I, I, also, I just love learning more and more from an Old Testament scholar, and I learned things tonight I hadn't heard before, even though I'd read some various books. So thank you very much. Yeah, I would say that um, although we are very close together, and I've, always, I've actually known that from before, <laughs> um, my, my focus is not on trying to show a harmony. My focus is saying, you know, until 2013, I had never thought of how the question of evolution related to the early chapters of the Bible. I just taught the early chapters of the Bible. And then people like your wife, head of Biologos and others, heard me give a presentation and said, you need to be talking about evolution because this is compatible with evolution. But I wasn't thinking about it in terms of evolution at all. Just thinking about, on its own terms, what's the Bible saying? And it turns out that it's helpful for people in the sciences. So that's kind of where my approach is. You notice that out of all my, what I said, not even 5% was about how evolution really related to it. The rest was just biblical details, which I think was relevant to evolution. Right, so I want to echo that. Scientists like me who do sometimes wrestle with questions science raises go running to scholars like you, New Testament, Old Testament scholars, theologians, and find the help we need.